Welcome back, everyone. Another episode of Feather and Fur. Your host, Brad Herlovus. Tonight, we have on returning guest, Leanne Austinson, and we are going to recap her hunting season and to see what she's looking forward to. All What's right. going on, Leanne? I'm um, just showing off my trophy this year because the last time we did this, I hadn't had a nice buck. So I just wanted to say I've stepped up my game a little bit. I it's see that. Of- Kind of matches this awesome one on my shirt. I'm like, I mean, that's I mean, that's always the the goal, right? To shoot a buck that's as big as the one on your shirt, right? Like no one walks around with like spikes or forks on their shirts. They're always walking around with like eights or tens or like good mass. So I mean, I feel like that's a, like accomplishing a goal, like taking a buck that's as big or bigger than your t-shirt you're wearing, right? You know, so and I especially when I had to go all the way to Mexico City just to get this damn shirt. Well, there you go. I mean, that's just like one upping the ante. Now you're now you're like blending cultures. Like it's next level. That's it's next level hunting. Exactly. Except the deer are a little bit bigger here. I'm not even a hundred percent sure what they all have down there, to be honest, for the different species of deer. That is out of my wheelhouse, that's for sure. Mine too, but if I ever get to hunt there, I'll look for them. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, you, how can you how can you not go there? How can you go there and be like, eh, I don't feel like hunting? Yeah, no. I mean, you got to figure out a way. Where there's a will, there's a way, right? I'm pretty sure there's no vacation where I don't think about hunting or fishing opportunities. <laughs> well, I mean that that's awesome. I mean that just shows like the passion you have for the outdoors and. You kind of do it all. I mean, from archery hunting to, I know for a while you were dabbling in upland hunting with a very non-typical breed. I mean, that's always fun right there in itself. And also fishing from the kayak and the boat and shore. Like it, it's, it's, yeah. it's good to talk to someone else that is so diversified as I am and that just can't focus. I mean, really, I'm going to call it we're <laughs> diversified, but really we just can't focus. Yeah, but we're like the best employees anyone could have because we always have a plan B and a plan C and we know how to get our work done quickly so we can go out and enjoy things, you know? That's true. I mean, that is true. Like, if the weather's crap for this, it's probably great for that. So let's go do this instead. Yeah, it really actually plays in favor of my career and everything like that because you're just constantly thinking about what next or anticipating a change, you know? It's, I don't know. It just, if I was an employer, I would be like, if you put your hunter and fisherman on your resume, you're hired. (laughs) It shows you can focus. It shows you can multitask. It shows you can plan and execute. I mean, it's kind of true. It's kind of true. We should be in serious demand in the workforce. Exactly. That's except for during the rut. Like that should just be like sabbatical. See, now maybe you're onto something. Maybe we need to find that perfect niche in the workforce where, cause we can plan, we can execute, but then come fall. It's just two months off. Right. It, it's like, it's like, and I'm not saying that like teachers get the summer off if they don't teach summer. So they get the summer off and like, that's all like, I understand they have stressful jobs. They busted hard for those eight months or nine months, 10 months, whatever it works out to be. I don't know. I don't have kids. I don't know how long we get off for for summer. Four months seems pretty long. So it's probably more like they work hard for 10 months, but how about those? I think we need that plan for hunters. I think we need career choices for hunters that allow you to pick the two months you want off. Right. That or you got to buy a generator and take that shit with you. I am already on that path. So I've got the camper. I picked up the generator. The next purchase will be Starlink. So I have internet access wherever I go. And then we are going to do a trial one. I am going to do a multi-week trip this fall with just my dog and myself. My wife will be staying home and we will see how well this works. Yeah. You know, I mean, a lot of times and just in jobs in general, you know, sometimes the timing just doesn't match to what we are passionate about. But you know what, if you can just, that's one of the things about technology now that is, you know, it's a blessing and a curse, right? You can't get away from it. But at the same time, I can bring it with me so I can sneak away for two hours in the evening to go hunt or something like that. So 
there's definitely definitely something to be said about working a desk job that allows remote. And not everybody can do that. I mean, I used to work in the field and there was no possible way for me to work remote. It just wasn't even an option. It's really hard to fix heavy duty equipment from halfway around the country, right? Like there's certain things like there's still plenty of professions and careers out there that you need to be on site for. But those of us that are lucky enough that have been able to find this remote work in these full-time remote positions like I have, it definitely opens up unique opportunities to be able to travel, explore different areas and expand hunting and fishing opportunities. Yeah, I just strategically make sure I have sales calls down by the lease and it works out perfect. <laughs> there you go. Then 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 you're traveling for work and you just happen to have to take a break at a certain time to go sit in your tree stand. I mean, it just happens. Right? So I'm laughing because Boo Boo's behind me. She's not the un unorthodox hunting dog, but <laughs> honestly, she should be a hunting dog. And I would totally consider like a poodle breed for hunting someday. Yesterday, I let her outside and she wasn't coming in. And I'm like, what's going on? Well, lo and behold, Easter's around the corner. And what do we have? Three baby bunnies on the side that Boo Boo found and is, you know, ready to play with them. <laughs> Gordy walked past him five times. Didn't even mind. Didn't like you put no. Pippa, you put Pippa out there. There would no longer be any baby bunny bunnies, and that's a bearded know, right? and that's a bearded German dog. I mean, they've got such a fur drive; it's a yeah. blessing and a curse. It's pretty cool to watch Boo Boo and how she does that, though. I was just like, "What are you doing?" And right there, pinpointed them like nothing. That's pretty Thank good because she's she's old too. Yeah. So, I mean, Gordy's gonna get pretty sad over here, but he does. He holds his own. He's a good boy. He's a good dog. Everybody needs a companion. You know, he makes me feel safe, whether or not we get any birds or, you know, I would have tried. I wanted to like, I, I had him with when I got my buck this year in the truck. And I really, really wanted to like let him track it after, but it, thankfully it, it died in front of me about 40 yards away. So there wasn't really a tracking opportunity. Well, that's, well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that hunt. Yeah. Well, I, I, I haven't even really talked to you yet about it. So I'm curious, like how it all played out. Like, like, like set the stage, tell us the story. Like what happened? Like, well, first of all, I have to just set the stage about kind of the situation or what my body shape was in it this time, because since June, I had been dealing with herniated discs in my lower back. And I um, I was fishing this summer. I don't normally musky fish or anything. I was going for bass and bass. And I happened to land a really nice musky. Um, but I had to like, it was heavy. I had to traverse getting on the rocks and doing the 20 minute, let it breathe and move it back and forth and whatever that's called, you know, all the etiquette. Um, to keep it alive. So I released it. Well, then I'm out two days later and I catch another one. And then by the end of the week, I caught my third one. And by the weekend, I got my cousin or my nephew on a 48 incher. So I'm just going to yeah, say let's, that. Let's, let's slow this down a second. Like you're all like, oh, I caught this muskie. I caught that muskie. Like what size muskies are we talking about here? Um, the first one was probably like 40. Four inches. I, oh, yeah, I just sent like a picture four, of yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, 44 <laughs> inches. Like nonchalant. Like, oh, yeah, 44 inch muskie in southern Wisconsin. <laughs> and she's all like, eh, whatever. No big deal. Like, I know anglers that chase muskies all the time that have still not caught a 40. Like, they focus well, on muskies and they haven't caught a 40. And you're like, yeah, whatever. Well, I, you know, I, I've had a fortunate and blessed year. But at the same time, those damn things, I really think torqued my back because one of them was in the kayak and it was just, I mean, it's awesome. I know people try really hard for them. Um, you know, maybe you should talk to bass fisher women or something like that. They can give you some secret baits because I caught mine all on the same bait. So that's, that's worth some money right there. But so, you know, this happens in June and super awesome catching those. I don't want to discredit them. I'm just not a musky fisher woman. Um, and like I said, they're heavy. Um, but anyways, so, you know, deer hunting's coming around and I'm laid up now for like 
it's been 10 weeks at least. And it was, it was horrendous. I think I was going to get to hunt this year. Um, I've never experienced anything like this. So I went and had a nerve block done because I was like, I just, I just need two weeks. Um, thankfully that helped and I was able to get out there and I had hunted like one or two days the week before. Um, but I had taken vacation the week of Halloween. Um, but I was taking it, it, you know, if anyone knows about herniated discs or like sciatica, the worst thing is pretty much sitting. And when you deer hunt, you sit in a tree stand a lot of times. So that was a little painful, but um, called my uncle up who I grew up hunting with. He always took me up north and was kind of my mentor and invited him to come out and see the property that I lease and just spend some time together. So he came came down there on Halloween and I think he got there at like two. So by the time we got to the woods, um, you know, just getting geared up, it was probably four o'clock. I got him set up in his stand um, and let him know where I was going. I didn't want him to have to walk too far because he's about 70. I get to my stand. I had just hung this stand like the week before because it was in a cow pasture. Um, and in Wisconsin lately, the weather's just been staying so nice that the cows, which I'm definitely afraid of, you guys, the cows haven't been out of this pasture until like the beginning of November. Normally, they're supposed to be out by the 1st of October. So I finally can get into this stand and it's just it's like it was just beautiful weather. But every just the noise, I don't know if everyone had a dry fall like we did, but just the. Uh oh, we might have lost Leanne here for a second. Hopefully she pops back in here. Hey, I don't know what happened there. That's all right. So anyways, so, so hold on. Like oh. we got to like, so we have an easy transition for Brian. Okay. Um, we'll say it's like 13 minutes to 15 minutes. Um, lost you there for a second, Leanne. You're back now. Yeah. As you were saying, it was a dry fall in Wisconsin. Yeah, it was super dry. And I was walking out there, you know, I'm going through a cow pasture. So it's, I had pretty smooth traveling and everything but and I don't have a ton of woods around me but I had some soybeans and a creek and so I get in my stand and I was maybe in there 20 minutes and I decided to do like a tending grunt I think I did like a four six four sequence in a matter of like 20 minutes um and all of a sudden I just hear this crashing and it was so loud um and I looked up kind of to the east of me and about 150 yards away, there was a huge buck just running through these soybeans. Um, and he was actually kind of heading up towards where my uncle was sitting. But I knew once he hit a certain corner that he was going to win him and that he was 
looking for, you know, the noise that I had been calling out. Um, and this is the first time ever for me that I've actually like gotten to see this all play out and just, just come in on a string. It was the coolest thing. Like I was able to stand up in my sand and kind of hide around my tree um, and get prepared thinking he was going to come down a certain way. Um, but he just kind of was hanging out. He didn't quite know what was going on. And I knew he was just, he, he did not know where I was. So I gave another, just a little sh short tending for grunter and I'm hidden perfectly. And he just kind of moseys on down, just kind of through the, the pasture on a hillside and came down a little hill. I was able to, but he totally went a different way than I was expecting. So I had to reposition myself again. I mean, um, did you really think it'd be that easy? I mean, it, you got to have a little bit of a challenge in there. Yeah, it was just, it was crazy. And he just, um, he got to a point where he was coming down a small hill by the creek. Um, and I had a small window because of some branches that I couldn't get trimmed up. And he stepped in it and I popped him and it was, it was just wonderful. Like it was, it was cool to see just like he, he had no clue I was there. Like I've always been busted before. So like to finally have this all kind of come together, especially when you're calling to them and you're so there's, you're so easily detected when you're grunting. Um, the fact that I was able to just like trick them, was a big feeling of accomplishment. I mean, calling in it, like that's one thing I love so much about duck hunting and goose hunting. And I see the appeal for turkey hunting, even though I really don't get into it. It's like calling at an animal and convincing them that you are what they want to. Like you're a hen, you're a hen, be it a turkey, be it a duck, be it like any of that. Like convincing them that this is where I am. I want you to come to me. And getting them to come to you is what's really cool. And I've never experienced that with deer hunting, but to have that deer come crashing through 150 plus yards away and you to give it a little bit of a correction grunt to bring it right into one of your shooting lanes, mm -hmm. it's pretty amazing to think about. Yeah, I was, I was so happy with it. And it kind of happened so perfectly that, I mean, I know there's bigger bucks around there. I've seen them, but I haven't gotten a big a decent sized buck in my life yet. Um, and for me, this was, he was outside the ears. He gave me the perfect opportunity. I have a craptastic back for how many months? I'm like, I really don't, that was my first day of vacation. And I was like, hey, if I do this now, I don't have to sit out here in pain. And so I took him and it, it was perfect. He you know, he went 40 yards, he expired quickly. It, it was great. And then grabbing the snow dog afterwards to help get in there because it, it was a good mile and a half that I go in from where he, he died. So, and I'm, you know, hunting in some pretty hilly country. It was, uh, the last thing I was going to do was drag that out or make my 70 year old uncle do it. And that's the cool thing. Like, I don't really, I mean, we haven't touched, I haven't touched at all with ice fishing on this show, but I'm an avid ice fisherman. I know you're an avid ice fisherman. We know a lot of other avid ice fishermen and multiple people. I know about four or five people now with snow dogs and they're in a, so for those of you that don't know, it's a small engine powered track machine. It's like just the track section of a snowmobile with like motorcyclish handlebars for the, or actually take that back. It's like a track of a snowmobile with like the handlebars off a push lawnmower. I mean, really, it's more like a push lawnmower. Like, so they work great for ice fishing because they're lightweight. They have a decent sized track to get through the slush and snow. But the cool thing about these is you don't need ice because they use, or snow, there's no reason for cooling. There's no slides for that need to be lubricated because they're fully bogey wheels. So you can use them in the woods, on dirt, in pastures, in fields, so it, it, it's really a unique piece of gear that offers you an opportunity to use it almost year round. 
Well, and for me, they come in, they just come in so handy because of, you know, with all the fishing regulations on the Madison chain and stuff like that and all the weight limits and, you know, you have to, or you need a UTV, an ATV, a snowmobile, like this thing kind of is a reasonable machine that can tackle a lot of things that I like to do. Um, it comes at one minor, like, issue is that you have to be somewhat me mechanical, you know, to operate it. You have to, sometimes you have to do maintenance. We live in such a, we want the easy button all the time. Um, but I think as hunters and, you know, anglers and stuff, we're so used to troubleshooting things. Um, you know, I bought it n with, with very little small engine experience. Um, but I have come a long way. And, and like, cool. like everything, like everything, there's a learning curve. There's a learning curve on driving it. It takes a little bit of upper body strength, like deep slush can be a, like a little bit of a challenge. It's not as easy as say an ATV or a UTV or a snowmobile necessarily to operate, but it's a super compact footprint. It fits on a hitch rack. Yeah. You, it doesn't take up much room to store. It can be used in very narrow and tighter situations compared to an ATV or a UTV. Like, so when you're hauling, like dragging a deer out of the like tighter woods or things like that, it's just a unique piece of gear. That's got a very interesting little niche in the market, which really fits like those, that outdoors men, outdoors woman niche. Yeah. And it's just like with anything, like you gotta, you gotta know its limitations, just like I have to know my own limitations in everything that I try to do, you know? So, but it, all in all, you know, like we end up getting this deer out of there and I th it was just, I couldn't have been, I had a really great season this year, whether it was fishing or hunting, um, you know, somebody was looking out for me, making sure I wasn't having to sit out there and suffer through all that. A beautiful deer came right by me, like my second sit. Um, you know, it's just kind of, it's cool as you get to hunt the same property time and time again. This was only my second year, but how you learn the patterns and you kind each year you just get a little bit better and wiser on where they might be. Absolutely. And when you're hunting that same area, like I know you lease land, I'm privileged. I, I, I'm very lucky in that my father-in-law has got some private land. You start to really, and if you don't have big changes in those areas, you can really pattern those deer. And once you pattern it, those patterns stay relatively true year after year, at least they mm -hmm. have by me, making it, I wouldn't say easier, but easier to be in the correct place at the correct time to have opportunities at these larger deer or deer in general to put meat in your freezer. Yeah. You know, and I will, and I'll admit it. I'm cause I'm, I'm not one of these people who's in that whole compound crossbow debate, whatever. If I use a crossbow and it, it was, it was a super clean kill. It was nice. Um, I will say sometimes a part of me thinks, oh, I, I kind of want to try compound. I want to challenge myself a little bit more. Um, but, you know, I'm so sick of hearing everybody argue about this. It's just like, because that compound bow hunter has 25 trail cameras that are cell cams, because that's any better. You know, it's, it's like fishing without a fish finder. You know, just... We're all out here. It's not easy, you know, getting out there and putting in the work to get your stands up and to scout and to do all that. We do it because it's a sense of reward when you finally accomplish something. Absolutely. And I'm all for any hunter using any legal means in their area to hunt with. If that's a compound bow, if that's a crossbow, if you're a, a traditional hunter with a recurve or a longbow, whatever fuels your passion to me, I'm 100% okay with. I understand that there's different difficulty levels between those, but it's not my place to judge what your deer, what, what's a trophy to you. It's also not my place to judge what legal means of equipment you're using. I mean, there's so much in on social media now that is so negative that if you went to a deer check-in station 10 years ago, 
and you saw a kid with his first spike buck that's that's a bucket and he's jacked up you're going to congratulate him mm -hmm. now on these social media pages you see people talking to kids saying should a lot of should a lot of weight that that's just a juvenile like that's a young buck like you shouldn't have shot that i don't know who's teaching you who's your mentor but they they you don't have a good mentor there's no way i would shoot that buck. Like, it, it's crazy it blows my mind how confident people are behind a keyboard that they never would have said this in person so i get the whole like staying completely out of those debates i don't get into them either i'm never going to judge someone's trophy or what they consider to be a trophy I'll never judge what legal means they're using for hunting either. And that's why we're friends. <laughs> I I see a lot of advantages to a, to a crossbow and other like, yes, I understand like there's advantages to the fact you don't have to hold draw weight, blah, blah. I'm not even talking about that. Mm -hmm. I would rather hunters. And I, I know I've said this before on the show and I'll say it again. If you're not going to dedicate the time it takes to make sure that you're actually shooting a compound bow accurately and you're spending the time on the range, you're practicing, you're getting the muscles built up so you can properly hold it. If you're not going to put the dedication into that, I would rather you use a crossbow, treat it at ethical ranges like a compound bow, but eliminating that human factor because at the end of the day, you're going to have less wounded deer. And wow. to me, an ethical kill is what we should all strive for. Right. Well, and I think that's, you know, I think it's rare that somebody would be like, well, I'm going to start with a crossbow and switch to a compound. But, you know, sometimes you have to get your feet wet. You have to do something and, and get confident in something um, in order to kind of step to a, a different you know, level, just like with using bait casters last year, like I had always used spinning reels. Um, and I challenged myself to something different. And I'm telling you, it was a challenge. But boy, it feels awesome when you finally like accomplish it and learn something new. And, um, you know, so a lot of times with hunting, I, especially bow hunting and using a crossbow and stuff. I know the crossbow can have an advantage, but you also just have to you just have to grind it out. You have to be in the right place, in the right position. You know, you have to. You have to be ready for it. And all those years of failure and all those mistakes every year of deer hunting, it eventually, if you learn from them, you get better. Like think of the, like, what was it? Four years ago when I was like, I shot my first deer and you came and gutted it out for me. Look at hey, where. It, hey, the fir first one's always free. The second one's on you. Right. You know, like from going out and doing something that to to buying stands and put hanging your own stands and not, trust me, it's not because I don't want to depend on a man. I would love it if Brad wanted to come out and hang my tree stands. <laughs> but how much more? I mean, but yeah, I, and yes, if you called me and said I need help training tree stands, I'd come out in a heartbeat because we're friends, and I would do that for mm -hmm. any one of my friends. That doesn't matter, guy girl dog whatever it doesn't matter who you are what you are i don't really care you're my friend i'll come help you but the yeah. difference is like when you do it start to finish there's a different level of satisfaction of pride knowing that from start to finish you looked at the terrain you determined where the trails were you figured out the deer patterns you put your stand in a place that would put you in give you an opportunity to have a shot on what was a gorgeous buck for you and then you executed when that time came. Yeah. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with help, but there's a little bit more pride and there's a little bit more satisfaction when you've done it all yourself. Oh, there is. Like, it's so funny because it's like, you know, it's just, it's hard to explain to people what that feels like because I think we're living in an era where a lot of people kind of want everything done for them and they don't get a lot of sense of satisfaction in their life. Um, simply because people don't naturally challenge themselves. Uh, you know, most, most people are always going to take the path of least resistance. And like, there is just, you know, I think that's the thing that I'm addicted to is like being able to do it. You know, like I watched that. Have you seen the new Netflix series Outlast? I have not. It's kind of like a survivor show where they're teamed up, but like I was 
I, you know, binged watched it in like two days. And I was like, I kind of, I would love to do something like that. Cause it's like psychological with people as a team, but then like all these like survivalist skills and it's always sure. going to, like how we would do. And I agree. I mean, who, who doesn't, it takes a special type of person to not take the easy route. And I'll admit it. I take the easy route when I can in, a, in plenty of situations. I mean, well, we're not stupid. <laughs> right. I mean, there's something to be said about working smarter rather than working harder. Right. But I understand what you're saying that there's just a little bit more, like we were saying, there's just more pride in, in doing everything yourself in certain situations. And just knowing that you were able to use the knowledge you have gained over the past four years to harvest that buck. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's yeah, a lot just like all, just everything with it like just all the like if like I think back of when I started hunting as like a 12 year old and now I'm 40 and it's like just like how each year stacked on top of each other just all the different experiences and the things you like you just start looking at that you never looked at when you were 12 years old or 14 or 20 versus what you see today it's just it's different sorry to get all philosophical or whatever but no i mean it's good though it's good because it shows it shows commitment to the traditions also like it's commitments to the tradition it's commitments to getting yourself out in the woods and perfect and perfecting your craft yeah I think that's that's a good way of putting it you know it's a it's awkward because i feel like i don't i'm not in tune with other hobbies that people have that make them feel that way but i'd imagine like musicians or you know dance people i don't know professional couponers have their passion you know what i mean <laughs> but and and, but that's exactly what this is like. This is our passion as hunters and we're all striving to become better and perfecting our craft. And that's what every year you get out in those woods and you learn something like this past year, you were lucky enough to learn what worked and what worked in that situation next year, different situation, different weather, different patterns, different other things. You might need to rely on different experiences to make sure you're in that right position. Yeah. Yeah, I'm always, I always find myself doing the most unorthodox approaches because I watch, like you mentioned social media, I read too much crap and I'm always like, well, why does everybody say it has to be done this way? Let's try it this way, you know? Well, uh, experimenting like that's always fun. I mean, as long as you're experimenting safely, I mean, there's certain things like everyone says like use a harness while using a tree stand. Well, yeah, there's a reason for it. Don't be like, oh, I don't need to do it that way. Like there's a difference between doing things different and being safe while doing it, right? Yeah. Like I love the saying, doing dumb things safely. Yeah. Yeah, but you kind of, you know, that's the other thing, like just being a hunter and fisherman, you do everything more safe. Like you just have this, you just have this brain that is wired to think about all the most insane scenarios that can happen. <laughs> I still have to get out duck hunting with you one of these days. We'll make that happen. I know you're not a big fan of marshes, but I mean, I've got the big boat now, which is basically like a barge. So it's not like anybody gets out of the boat anymore. It's not even needed. So we've got that with the heater and the blind and everything else. We'll get you out. It'll be a good time. Get you, get you into, get you, let you experience the marsh. There's something special about that. And unless you've been out there, like I've been in the woods and I've watched the sunrise through the woods as the woods come to life. And that's always amazing to me. But there's yeah. just something special about being getting out on the water when it's pitch black, setting all your decoys, getting tucked into where you're going to hide and watch like and you start to like even before you see a glimmer of light, you start to hear birds and you hear ducks quacking or geese honking, or you hear blackbirds chirping. And as that sun comes up and you start to get the reflection off the water and you have, and you start to see silhouettes of birds in the sky, it's, it, there's just something different about it. And it's so unique and it's so 
amazing that like you have to experience in person. You know, I have heard, I have a couple buddies who, like a couple of them have even given up like deer hunting because they love just being out there duck hunting. And like, you guys are so, I mean, I'm pretty passionate about deer hunting, but I don't feel like I have a love affair with it like you guys do for those ducks. And I actually think that's one of the reasons why I'm afraid to try it. I'm afraid I'm going to like it. And then I'm going to have, you know, buy all this <laughs> new stuff. Well, the nice thing is when you have that itch, you can just come with me because I have everything you could possibly need. Well, I think part of it, like the guys that I know are like super passionate about it. I would say most of them have dogs. And I think it's the dog that a lot of times that drives that passion. I know it is for me with a plant and with duck, my dog and watching the dog work drives a lot of the passion. And the other thing too, I mean, for us people that are ADHD that don't like to sit still and sit with their own thoughts. I mean, you get a handful of people in a duck blind. It's nothing but ridiculousness, joking around and craziness the entire time until the, you see some birds working and then it's like 30 seconds of hyper focus, maybe a minute, the birds are gone, whatever's on the water you're dealing And then like instantly it's right back to joking around. Like, I can't believe you missed that shot. What's wrong with you? Like do your job, sure. do your job. The dog's now mad at you. Get to work. Is so that, like, <laughs> like is calling for ducks easier than using those breed thingies they use for turkey hunting? Cause I have tried those those things and i cannot use them mouth calls mouth calls yeah. like i still use mouth calls i practiced a lot with those for turkey hunting but i use them a lot for predator hunting i keep a mouth call in my deer hunting bag all the time as well because i can do some pretty good squeals on that so if i do see a coyote like my hunt always turns to a predator hunt as soon as i see a predator it's just it is what it is for me so i mean i see a coyote it's a coyote hunt i don't care what i'm hunting um but a duck call and a goose call is a musical instrument they take practice. It's very rare. I see someone pick one up and can just do it. Like it's repetition. It's practice. The people that are really good at calling practice their calling and they're calling year round and they're practicing and they're, and it's a lot of muscle memory and it's just like a musical instrument. That's the best way I can put it. It's like a musical instrument. Well, I might have to, I might just have to be the one shooting then. Because... That's all right. I'm not that, very musical. And as a new hunter, I don't expect anybody to call. Like that's on like the people that are experienced. And I know experienced hunters that can't call. They're just not good at it. And but, they just don't do it. So here's the thing I don't understand is like, how come your duck calls are so pretty? Like my grunt call is not pretty. Your guys' flipping duck calls are like the most pretty water bong looking thing. <laughs> Like it's like a, it's like a piece of jewelry. So there's plenty of calls out there still made of wood and different polymers and stuff like that, that aren't as pretty, but there's also some really gorgeous wood calls out there. Don't get me wrong. When you get into your exotics, I love a Coca Bolo call. I love my single read echo timber and Coca Bolo. I can get down, I can get dirty, I can get gritty and it just looks pretty. But oh, with, the so cool. with the competition, with the competition calling, a big thing that came out was acrylic calls. And acrylic sounds different. And acrylic are those expensive, pretty, jewelish looking colors. And like those are unique. And I also have acrylic calls. They're louder, they sound different. I couldn't tell you how much though is more to buy the hunter than the duck. I've shot just as many ducks over a $20 call as I have over my $160 acrylic. Sure. I like the way my acrylic sounds better. I feel like I can manipulate the tone better. I don't know what the ducks think, though. I mean, I've had plenty of ducks land to a $20 call compared to a $100, $50 call. Like, I probably had the same. To be honest, I probably had more ducks come to that $20 call. Sure. So part of it's well, probably just, the hunt, hunters. I mean, it's kind of a weird thing to notice about you duck hunters, but um, I always, like, I'm in awe and looking at your guys' arsenal of stuff you have hanging on your chest there with those calls because they, I mean, they're kind of pretty. I agree. I like, 
I love a good wood call. I have custom Cocobolo Predator calls. So I've got a custom Howler and a Screamer in po uh, in Pocobolo and or in Cocobolo, and I love that wood. I love the grain. I love the way it looks. Um, I know other people are really like. There's plenty of other exotic woods out there that people just really like. So do you like drive around in your your truck and on your way to sales calls and meetings and just practice? I always keep duck calls in my vehicles and practice as I'm driving around. Sure. I do that for deer, but it's a little bit different. I just stop at the stop sign and just practice. You also see those exotic woods and turkey calls too, like pot calls, slate calls, things that are turned like that. You'll also get those guys that really like those pretty exotic woods there as well. I think I think it's just I don't I don't even know if they would say it gives me more confidence, but having a call that works well that I enjoy looking at, it's just another piece that well, another piece of that puzzle for me. This, I get an attraction to that. Plus, it's made out of just nature and it's beautiful. I mean, I had that big black walnut this summer go down in my backyard, and it was like 140 years old, and I cried. Be, because seeing like the lines and just the texture and the everything in that wood and the life of it, like it was beautiful. Like I was so passionate and sentimental about it. Like it's just, I mean, it was, you know, some people are vegetarians, don't want to eat meat, but like trees are animal, they're living creatures, you know? So I can understand, I can relate to like, being passionate about that kind of thing. It's just one more thing us stock hunters attach to. I mean, it's no different than shotguns. We argue about shotguns all the time and we argue about what's the best choke or what's the best shot and all this ridiculousness. But at the end of the day, duck hunters give a good, like we give it just as well as we take it. So like we joke mm -hmm. around a lot in the blinds. It's just a different kind of hunting because it's, it's just fun like it's laid back it's exciting it's giving your buddy a hard time but at the same time it's congratulating them 30 seconds later it's just like it really cements like really good friendships sure I, I think that's really the key is that duck hunting just anchors these bonds that are hard to build with deer hunting or other styles of hunting because they're more solo mm -hmm. you're like, all in it like, are oh, you the oh, yeah. blind or whatever that is? Absolutely. Like I said, it's 30 Sorry. seconds of focus. The rest of the time you are laughing, you're telling jokes, you're talking, you're drinking coffee, you're making breakfast. You don't have to be quiet. You don't have to worry about smells. You don't have to worry about any of that. It's 30 seconds of hyper-focus when ducks are in play. And then after that, it's like just a bunch of people hanging out at a Friday night at the bar almost, like sure. just minus the beer. Well, have you ever taken anyone out who has a fear of swamps like that, like I do? No, but I figure we'll get you over it quick. We'll just throw you in it. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. I don't I don't know what it is about marshes, but I, there's there's just something. And I watch a lot of these duck hunting shows because I am intrigued by it. But like that, just the dark water and like just not, I just always feel like it's going to be like a quicksand type of experience it bottom conditions can vary just as much as your woods can vary for deer hunting so i've been in endless muck like where it's like it never you never stop sinking and you're waist deep in muck and you're clawing your way out some of the spots i hunt are sand like mm -hmm. legitimate sand that is ankle deep that you could sit down in and waders and just hang out like so I hunt a variety. I mean, I, there's also some backwater pockets I hunt that flood certain times of the year, depending on our rainfall, and it's hard bottom. It never even turns muddy because it's, it's flooded timber, basically, at that point. Sure. So it's super hard bottom. So it really depends on where where we go to hunt. Now, I'm going to take us where there's birds. That could, if I can, if I am on birds with a bottom that's more comfortable for you, that's where we'll go over that'd be, somewhere that'd else. But now if where I'm at, the birds are in a marsh and it's soupy bottom, that's where we're going to go. But with my big boat running that 1856 Pro Drive, there is zero reason you would ever have to get out of it. Sure. 
So for you, you wouldn't know if the bottom is sand or if it's muck. You're never going to leave the boat. Like, what if your dog won't won't go get it? Then you drive the boat out there and get the dock. And then, but like, well, I guess your boat's, yeah. it's You've never not been able to, like, use your boat to go get it? No. No. If my boat got me there, it can get me around in there. Sure. If that makes sense. Like, yeah, I'm not going to. Just picture, like, I just picture me shooting one and then Pippa being like, yeah, you're on your own. <laughs> and I'm like. No, we would use no because we would use the boat to go get it if we had to, or I would walk out and get it, like depending on what the bottom conditions are. I would never like I've taken lots of new people out duck hunting. I'm not I've never once been like, Well, I need you to go buy waders, I need you to go buy this. No, come as you are. Like if we're in my big boat or if we're shore hunting or something like that, come as you are. Dress with the dress with whatever clothing you have for the conditions, and we'll make sure some way somehow you're hidden. And when it comes to retrieving birds, it'll be me if it gets cold out because I, I put Pip away when it gets too cold because she's 11 years old and her arthritis hurts her on that. I go get the birds myself. Either way, I would never expect someone that I'm mentoring or showing duck hunting for their first time to have an investment in equipment. Got it. So in other words, you're just going to bring me so I can shoot them and hit them. Pretty much. And then get you addicted to it. So you start buying licenses and then start going to events and working on making sure Habitat sticks around for the next generation. And I'm just going to suck you into the, the the cyclone of duck hunting. You gotta, it's got to be a struggle sometimes picking which one you want to do, upland or dock or not too bad. It's not bad because my focus is my dog. So for me, it's pretty easy. October is spent upland hunting. And that's some of the best duck hunting in our state during certain times. Like our big migration bush comes through middle of October pretty religiously. Like there's a giant bush. But for October, I spend that time upland hunting with my dog. Beginning of November as well. But like once we get into deer hunting season, I transition to waterfowl. And then I push hard towards the end of waterfowl. And during any type of open gun deer season, I don't run my dog in the woods just because of safety reasons. Sure. So youth hunt, anything like that, I'm waterfowl hunting. And then come after once gun deer starts, which is middle of November, and we have until like the first week of December. After that point, I'm as hardcore waterfowl as I can be. I normally take off the entire week of Thanksgiving and hunt that entire 10 days. It works out to be all for waterfowl. So that's where I really do my waterfowl focus towards the end of the season. Um, with Pip being about 11, are you going to, do you get another puppy in training or you wait? What do you do? I would already have a puppy if, but with her being a rescue yeah. and not being good around other dogs, I mean, it's bet She's better now than she ever has been, but I would never introduce a puppy to her yet. Sure. And I would never do a co like dog in this house at this point in time with her. So for now, I go with Pippa. And if I wind up in a situation where Pippa has to be retired, but she's still with us and I can't get another dog, I might folk, I might re I might grab my compound bow out of the out of the case and get back into archery hunting. Sure. I might go a hundred percent all in on waterfowl and just retrieve my own birds. I don't know what I'll do if that time comes. Well, and even if you go up north, you got the camper. She's comfortable in there. She can still be, you know, we all age. At some point, oh, yeah. you go along for the fun and maybe not all the hard work. And but she'll still, still even once she gets retired from being a from from hunting hard, she'll still. I have spots that are easy hunts. Even if she can still walk, she'll sure. be able to still enjoy it. But once she retires, like those hard hunts and that and that real that grind. She'll be done with the grind. The grind will be done. Can you sense it? Like, I mean, I haven't, I've never had a working dog like that. You know, I've always, you know, I've had boxers and stuff. So never really had a dog that kind of told, like gave me that signal of like, when am I going to be able to go do my thing? You know, did she do that? Is it like, can you just sense it? It's driving her or, or not? I have a good pulse on her. She's got a good off switch though. I mean, but we keep her, in, I keep her in good shape. We walk her every night. We still run her. I train with her. Um, 
but I keep a really close eye on her. So when we're running her, I'm check, I'm watching her hips. I'm watching her elbows. I'm looking to see if she has arthritis, how, how the cold is affecting her, how heat is affecting her, all of those things to make that educated decision that says it's time to slow you down because her drive is so much she would hurt herself. Sure. So that's where you have to go in and you have to slow the dog down, either to use different terrain hunt shorter periods of time, whatever it is, hunt better conditions, no longer hunt the hot days, no longer hunt, hunt the super cold days, hunt those moderate days that's easier on their bodies, things like that. Uh, I feel like Gordy has a lot of drive. Like sometimes I'm amazed at how many times I can throw that Frisbee for him and he is never tired. But this, um, I had, I told you I had had Gordy without for that my vacation when I was got the deer and um the day before I had taken him for a walk on just the other portion of the property that I was camping on but not hunting um and he literally it was like he started like smelling rubs and he was pointing them for me weird all of us because I had gotten on a scrape line it was it's crazy. I hope I get to hunt this side of the street sometime. Biggest <laughs> scrape line I've, I've ever seen. And then all of a sudden, Gordy's like, he's just posturing, you know? And I look and I'm like, oh, shit, there's a rub. Well, then I go 20 yards up and he's doing it again. And I look a couple feet from this grass and he's doing it again. So it's kind of just, it's just so neat when you're out there with them and they just teach you different things or like they catch on a, this isn't just your average walk. We're actually kind of trying to accomplish something out here. So let's make myself sure. useful, you know? That was cool. I actually got it on video because I was so like, wow, you know, just was impressive. But That's awesome. So what are you looking forward to this year, Leanne? Any big plans? Any big trips? Not a lot of big trips or anything like that. Just kind of. You know, you know me, my trips are local. They're my opportunities to get out and hunt and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I don't, oh, I, I feel kind of boring. We do a lot of camping. We're not boring. We just, our trips are different in the sense of like, Leanne wants to do what she likes to do. Sure. <laughs> you know, but I think we're going to hit over, um, head over to the Kickapoo and try and hit some of those remote campsites. Sure. Um, I got, you know, I got that little A-liner, so it's pretty comfortable. And then bought that generator this year, so it kind of makes camping, camping's easy because when you have dogs and they are your life, you kind of, you know, plan your vacations around them. Yes, you do. I I understand that completely. Yeah, so that's probably what we'll be doing, and um, gonna hit Black Hawk County Park. Nice. Have you fished that yet? No. Or do you ever camp there? Nope, I have not. That's a state park in Wisconsin. Um, nope, I've never been there. I really like that one, and we always kind of um, camp right around morel mushroom season so we're going to be a little late this year but there might be some oyster mushrooms and fishing going on and just i don't know that i've uh i want to go i want to experience like elk hunting at some point and i'm starting to realize i better shit or get off the pot because i'm not getting any younger so um but, you know, to do one of those hunts or something like that, you actually, you have to plan for like a year. Oh, yeah. It takes definitely de takes some planning. I've looked into it. I'm not ready yet to pull that trigger. I, mean, I agree. Like, going to have to, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to do it sooner than later. But there's definitely some more destinations I want it. Like, when I get my next pup, I want to make it to Arizona for quail. Oh. I want to make it, I want to make it out, I want to make it out west for chucker. Like, I want to make it out west for grouse, like different species of grouse, the spruce grouse. Like, we don't have spruce in Wisconsin. We don't have blues in Wisconsin. Like, there's a lot, like, we don't have prairie chickens in Wisconsin, so I want to get to the plains for that. There's a lot of bird species I want to go chase. And 
while elk is on my list, there are so many bird species higher than it that I need to focus there. But I will say, if I would have to retire Pippa, and there, I know there, and there's going to be a year or two in there where I'm dogless per se because she's retired, that will be the year I jump to go archery hunt out west for an elk to go get my aunt to go get an antelope. Like if I can fit it all in, but in that time period, maybe go to Canada for a moose. Sure. Like that is when I would take that, like it's a now or never approach and we're going all in. So was it this, was it snow geese that you were going to go do this spring? It was that trip unfortunately got canceled due to some crazy weather conditions and a lot of snow where I was supposed to go. Yeah. So, um, Ask the snow geese invitation and invite me to trucker or quail and I'm on it. <laughs> Actually, I shouldn't even say that because I bet you snow geese would be fun. You'd be perfectly fine with snow geese. You're hunting in farm fields. I just think the little chuckers and stuff like that are just they're, quail. I mean, that would be so cool to do that. They have them in Georgia and like the Carolinas too. They do. Arizona. I want to get to Arizona, different country, and you can hunt everything from dry cactus to high plains there. Sure. They've got four species of quail, all wild. And like, scorpions and tarantulas, but I mean, whatever. It's, it's part of it. It's part of it. You'd be hearing shots going off left and right. <laughs> oh, no, I saw a tarantula. <laughs> That's um, awesome. I'll yeah, I'm not very good at planning vacations, so I do appreciate the invites and the creativity from you because sometimes, like, you just get so, you just get so, like, in your own just experiences and what you like to do that sometimes I forget to think of other opportunities that I probably would actually really like. Sure. Um. So now that that has my head spinning because that does sound like a ton of fun. <laughs> there's so many different we there's so many different unique experiences out there. Like I'd like to get to Maine for rough grouse because there's completely different traditions up there, and I'd like to see that area. So I mean, yeah. there's just a lot I want to explore yet. That is I just, for sure. And I know we're almost up, but I just feel like sometimes living in Wisconsin, like I don't know how anybody could ever be bored here. There's, I feel what Wisconsin can offer is very diverse mm -hmm. and I really enjoy living here. I really do. Yeah. Like I, I mean, sometimes I think it would be nice to live in a warmer climate sometimes and stuff, but I just feel like sometimes we're so blessed with like all the different things we can actually do in Wisconsin or just in the Midwest in general, you know, we're kind of like, I think we take for granted what we have here in Wisconsin sometimes. I mean, I think I know I have until I leave here and I'm like, gosh, what is there to do in this state? Like, you know, or you're searching for pit stops along the way for a camping trip and there isn't a river or stream every five miles. Like, it's just, it's so sure. different. That is for sure. We like just the amount of water we have, the amount of lakes, the amount of rivers, everything else. It's very unique, and we have a lot of opportunities here. That is for sure. There's no doubt about that. Agreed. Except the only thing is, is like you have to have a big wardrobe. <laughs> you have to be able to dress for the weather. There is no doubt about that. Definitely. Well, hey, I have some other things I have to get done tonight, so. Well, that's all right. I'll give the next minute or two to you. Why don't you shout out your social media so everyone can follow you? Mm, oh, so that's the, yeah, I'm not very good with social media, but I'm on Facebook. Um, and then I am also on Instagram under Got Dibs, I believe. I'm really, I'll link that. I'm really not that hip. I need to, this is one of the things that Brad needs to help me get better with because I'm under, this is the new era. Um, and I'm, I rep for Mad Duck Ice Rods, um, ice fishing rod company out of Minnesota. So other than that, just 
go out and have some fun and go hunting and fishing and make memories. That's awesome. That's, I mean, that's what it's all about. Like, and as I close my show the same way, every time I, I say, it's always about those traditions. So it, it, that's, that's why I think you're, it's been great to have you on the show again, Leanne. Thank you for I, having me. Have a good night. My, you as well to all my listeners out there. Remember the Dale hollow paddle and fin tournament is coming up April 23rd. April 22nd and April 23rd down on Dale Hollow Lake at the beautiful Eastport Marina. If you're able to go check that out, that is a great run tournament with a lot of great hosts. I unfortunately will not be there this year, but there'll be plenty of us there to pick on. And until next time, everyone, keep changing that experience.